Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just make sure I can get in. Yes, so good morning, everyone. Um, so this is lecture three. Uh, before I start the lecture, can I just ask uh, if there are any questions? I mean, is the course material accessible? Is everything clear about what's expected of you? So we just so we just have a. I mean, I'll give you a couple of in a chat of where we are, because uh, we're going to change direction slightly. We've been looking top down, uh, and today we'll look what at everything from bottom up perspective, and then towards the end of the lecture we'll make sure that it meets. Um, but I mean, has everything been clear? Uh, one of the things uh, I think Philip was mentioning yesterday was. Uh, and somebody else said, so what I do is, as you can see, I, I have some mathematics in the graph and also have a lot of data in the graph. And so the data is, I crunch, so I use a program that crunches the data and produces the graph within the slides themselves. Um, and it's much, much easier to do that. You can do things much, much faster, so, but they produce HTML slides. And you know this is what the future of presentation is going to be like. You know, PowerPoint is last generation. Uh, PowerPoint and LaTeX are last generation. The next generation of slides would be done with HTML. Um, and so the HTML slides means that uh, you can. They are very lightweight slides. You can see them uh, very clearly on your computer screens, mobile and mobile devices, it should work everywhere quite easily. You can swipe uh, left and right and it should work quite easily. But if you want a hard copy on your computer, all you have to do is convert them into PDFs and they convert into PDFs quite easily. Just print the slides, save them as PDF. I mean, I use a Mac, so I know on a Mac it's very, very easy, but I presume on Windows also, it's not very difficult, right? So a couple of you, have, a couple of other people have also asked me these questions. HTML slides, it's not a problem. Just convert them into PDF. Okay, let me bring the bring the slides up. So, and yeah, if, if any of you have a question while I'm bringing up the slides, please do speak up. Okay. Sorry, the iPad just takes, it always takes a few minutes to connect. Okay. There we are. Okay. So um, it may seem a bit of a strange title, Waterways as Public Capital. Um, what this lecture is going to do, so what we've been doing about doing is we're talking about growth from a top-down perspective. You know, what's What's growth? Why do economies grow? And if there's one thing you would have taken away from the last two lectures is the process of capital accumulation is extremely important. Most countries that have developed have developed through capital accumulation. What is capital? Capital is basically a stock of something. In the simplest way to think about it is machinery, but today we will take a more nuanced look at what is capital. So machinery, so you know, I was watching television yesterday and there was a documentary on how Cornish pastries are produced. And you know, on BBC, why was I watching it? Well, I don't know. I was just I was watching something else. And then this started and I kept watching it for some reason. And it talked about how Cornish pastries, uh, this particular company produces 180,000 Cornish pastries every day, and how it produces these Cornish pastries using machines. So the Swedes are taken, uh, the, the the root vegetable Swede is taken, it's used machines, sort out the Swedes, 
push them through, you know, and they get processed, they get processed, the puff pastry, everything is done through machines. So that's a very good example of a very capital intensive process where there are very, very few people working in making cornish pastries um, and largely everything is done through machines but if you imagine how cornish pastry started started or how the initial commercial production of cornish pastry started they were basically done by hand so you would have an oven but a large extent everything else was done by hand so as economies often develop they tend to become more capital intensive and the key thing is that developed economies, the price of capital is really cheap and the price of labor is high. Wages are high and interest rates are cheap. Um, and there is a bit of a jump, price of capital and interest rate, there's a bit of a jump. Uh, but as we go through the lecture and the next couple of lectures, that jump would become clear. In developing countries, the price of capital is very high and wages are cheap. So developing countries tend to have labor intensive goods. The labor intensive goods are actually quite cheap to produce, but with, when the labor works without capital, the labor is not very productive, they don't earn that much. And that is the heart of the development problem or the problem of poverty from an individual or household perspective, right? So the one broad thing that we notice is that developed economies have a very high capital base. The capital per worker is higher, the more developed the economy is, the more prosperous the economy. But the question is, what is capital? Is it just machinery? What about the waterways, rivers, uh, you know, kind of waterways? Are they some kind of capital? Roads, rail, uh, railway tracks, are they some kind of capital? So today what we'll do is we'll talk about different kinds of capital and especially the distinction between privately owned capital and publicly owned capital. So if you live at the end of a street and you know the, the street that you come on uh, to enter your house is owned by the government, it becomes public capital. But sometimes what happens is you have developments uh, and the street ends at the beginning of the development. So the development creates roads within the developments and they maintain it themselves and that becomes private capital. So the notion of public and private capital is not just about who owns it, but there are other complications to that. So what we will do today is look basically at capital, capital and we'll look at different kinds of capital and we'll look at how do we know it's public and private and we'll look at the role of the government and what I'll then do, do later is in subsequent lectures is bring this back into the uh, growth framework. And when I bring it back to the growth framework, uh, you know, we'll get to the point that we were when we finished last lecture, when somebody said, what is A? Or is our mobile phones A? And you, know, you may have seen me struggle. <laughs> and the reason I struggled to answer that question is because I hadn't defined all the concepts that I need to answer that question. So mobile phones, as you can see, right at the beginning of the lecture, are um, part of the A, but the whole notion of A is more complicated and we need the next couple of lectures to understand uh, what A is before we go back to the curve. And by the way, um, what is A has been the most controversial thing in growth theory. Solo had a perspective on what A was, um, and Paul Romer in mid 80s started writing and defined A in a different way. Um, and he defined A in a different way, which meant that Romer's definition of A is useful for developed countries, whereas Solo's definition of the way he had defined it was useful for developing countries. So, you know, for us, Solo growth model tells us a lot of what we want to know. Romer, incidentally, is very useful it tells us what happens once you become developed, once you have a lot of capital and their interpretation, uh, you know, the interpretation of A in the Roma's uh, growth model is very different. And it was quite spectacular as well. So, you know, as I may have mentioned, Roma in the mid eighties for what the work he did as a young PhD student, he won a Nobel prize two years ago. Okay, back to this. So I'm gonna start off with, you know, the lectures till now have been relatively dry. 
But I'm going to start off with what I think is a really exciting paper. It's an exciting paper uh, about uh, the realities of developing countries and the realities of infrastructure and market in developing countries. So the example that we start off with is the coastal fish market in Kerala. Um, Kerala is a state in the south of India. It's on the west coast. And because it's on the west coast, it's been um, fairly connected to the rest of the world for a long time. Um, it, is, it, it, it is very multicultural. It got Christianity in the second century AD. Uh, it kind of, it has, it has uh, you know, one third of it is Muslim, one third of it is Hindu, and one third of it is Christian. Um, it's a coastal area, it's very developed. The human development indicators are very, very good. Uh, the human development indicators are, you know, so India is a developing country, the human development indicators are very low. So what are human development, development indicators? Infant mortality, um, life expectancy, literacy, things we'd seen earlier, you know, the probability of getting a disease. Um, for most of India, they are, human development indicators are very low, but for Kerala, human development indicators are very high and comparable to the developed countries. But uh, if you look at economic prosperity measured in money, it's still not very prosperous. So it doesn't have the capital accumulation process in place, but it uh, it has very high human development indicators. So it's it's a in, in the world of development, Kerala is a bit of a, a mystery, a bit like Cuba, um, where human development indicators are high, but there's no capital accumulation process or capital accumulation process is limited. Anyway, that's a side. The, what we are interested in is the coastal fish market in Kerala. So imagine you're a fisher, um, uh, fish person, you're a fisherman or a fisherwoman. You go out at four o'clock in the morning to catch the fish. So the state of Kerala, you know, you can see India in this. So you can see India here. This is India. And within that, this part, the southwest of India is Kerala. And as you can see, it's mainly a coastal, it's mainly uh, a coastal region, right? And so it's a lot of long coastline. And so the fishermen go out in the morning to fish and they catch their fish. And then early in the morning at about six o'clock when they're returning, they have a choice. When they're returning, they have a choice. If a fisherman is here, they have a choice of whether they want to hit and uh, deliver the uh, fish to market here, to market here or to market here. Right. So the huge advantage of a sea is that actually you're not constrained in your path. You can go to any of the markets along the coastal regions. And which market would you want to go to? The market which has enough demand for your fish and that you get a relatively good price for your fish. Now, you can imagine that it's a really complicated decision to make six o'clock in the morning. If you ask me to make a decision at six o'clock in the morning, I'd not be very good because I'd be sleepy. But I presume, um, you know, the fishermen are used to that, uh, uh, you know, so they're kind of more awake. But even with all that they know about the history of prices, so what would they know? They would know that last week I went to three different markets, right? So I landed up at three different markets, uh, and these were the prices, right? Based on that, I have to make a decision. And you know, how do you make a decision about which market to go? Now, here's the bit that gets really complicated, which is not only are you trying to predict the conditions in that market in terms of how much, is, how much demand there is and how much, but you also try to predict how much supply there is. So you have a bunch of people who do fish, fishing. So let's imagine you have 10 boats that you know maybe, maybe more than 10 boats, but let's imagine there are 10 boats that go out to fish. You have to predict where these 10 boats are going to deliver their fish load. Because if all of them deliver in the same market, there'll be too much supply and not enough demand. And in the other markets, there'll be a lot of demand. So when, you go, when you're going back, you're trying to predict not just the price, 
but you are trying to produce the supply of fish in that market because the price will be de determined by that. And that is really complicated to do. So there's this lovely, beautiful, there's a beautiful paper from 2007 uh, from Jensen. And, you know, it's kind of what Jensen did was basically looked at 15 different markets along the coastal area. And he just over a period of time studied the price pattern, the deliver, you know, the supply of fish and the demand of fish. Uh, now, as you see further on, it's not just that he studied it uh, at any time, he studied it at a crucial time when these markets were changing, right? And because he studied it at a crucial time when the markets were changing, he was able to extract a lot more information about what makes markets tick. And by the way, we are heading towards Pareto optimality, right? So we are heading towards trying to understand whether we can Pareto improve the markets, right? And you know, I hope you remember the definition of Pareto, but if you don't, we'll come back when I finish off the, the example, I'll come back to how this is related to Pareto. Okay. So what was Jensen doing? He was studying 15 fish markets along the 225 kilometer Northern coast of Kerala to understand whether the fish markets were working or not. Okay. Now, the key thing was that there are two players here. They're the fishermen or fisherwomen. I mean, I'm just using the term fishermen because they are mostly fishermen. You know, it's, it's a developing country. Uh, fishing is a dangerous thing and it's a cultural thing that most of the people who are on the boats are fishermen. Um, uh, so the, the decision is made by people on the fish, uh, on the boat, the fishermen of which market to go to. And then there are fish merchants. So in these markets, there are fish merchants because the fishermen don't go and set up stall to sell the fish. There are fish merchants in each market. So the fishermen go and sell the fish to the, give the fish to the fish, fish merchants and the fish merchants then sell it in the market. So, you know, that's the kind of retail aspect of it. Now, when they land, they find out what the price is or the supply conditions and what the demand conditions are, right? So if, if the consumers on one particular day are feeling particularly uh, wealthy, there might be more, more people if there is a festive occasion, there might be more people to buy the fish. Uh, fish is a staple diet in Kerala. But on the other hand, um, you might have a situation where people, there's been a, some kind of a shock, people, people don't have enough money. So on that particular day, People just decide that they're not going to have a fish, right? So I mean, the fish is a key thing here. Um, fish being a staple diet is a key thing here because on a regular basis, everyone in Kerala eats fish. So you'd really, you know, it's it's a bit like, uh, you know, you really have to, uh, you really have to be short of money to you know go and uh, to have a meal without the fish. Okay. Um, so there is a, as you can imagine, there is a lot of wastage. So what Jensen finds, finds is there's a lot of wastage. And the reason there is a lot of wastage is because from a outside perspective, if you were to control all the fishermen uh, going to different markets, you will do it in such a way so that they are spread out and there's no wastage. But given that these individuals are making decisions, they make mistakes. Sometimes all of them land up at one market they hear a rumor the last, uh, you know, uh, last week, there was excess demand in this particular market. Uh, so they all land up at that market and they end up creating excess supply. And the excess demand in, starts taking place in another market. So one example of what excess demand and excess supply is, is on 14 January, 1997, when Jensen's looking at it, uh, they find that this is what the markets look like. Okay, so let me explain this graph. So let's, so uh, on, the, on the horizontal axis is price. And on the vertical axis on the left-hand side is the measure of excess supply. So it's the measure of excess supply, which is how many boatloads of fish were destroyed or wasted because 
there was no demand for it. On the other side, you have number of unsatisfied buyers who could not buy fish. So excess demand, these are people who came to the market uh, and could not. So, you know, if it is not clear, um, it, it may not be clear, but it's 225 kilometer coastline. So 15 markets means each market is a fair distance away. Um, and the roads mean that from one market to another is two hours. We are also talking about 1997 and a relatively rural area. So refrigeration is not an option, right? So the reason in developed countries, we don't even think about this is because everything is refrigerated. And you know, this refrigeration itself is a new process as, as time has gone on, we, you know, supermarkets take refrigeration as, as, as granted, but refrigeration requires capital intensive uh, investment by some kind of a large organization that is able to take all the fish and move it to the right markets. And that's a capital intensive process and capital is really expensive. So anything that you can do in terms of labor and everything you can do in a small scale. So that is also something that has increasing returns to scale. Remember we talked about increasing returns to scale. So you would require a relatively prosperous company to say, I'm gonna take all the supply of fish and distribute it along markets, which is what supermarkets do for us. Um, but in the absence of that, you have small traders, fishermen, who are making the decisions of where to go. And because of lack of refrigeration, they, do not, they are not able to move the fish from one market to another. So let's say you land up at Baghdara and you find there's extra supply. By the time you'll go out and find another market, it'll be another two or three hours. So the timing is as follows. You, you decide at six o'clock which market to hit. You're there at the market at 7.30. That's the peak time where people come and buy their fish in the morning. And if you find there's excess supply, you can take the boat out again to the sea and go to another market. By the time you get there, it's nine o'clock, the market's gone. Right, so fresh fish, so there is a fresh fish, the market for fresh fish is a very short period early in the morning. Incidentally, um, if you lived in Britain for long enough, uh, you would have had something called kedgeri. Kedgeri is a dish that came up during the colonial period in Britain, in, in India, um, where fish used to be delivered early in the morning and it used to be made with fresh fish, you made kedgeri that's kind of a risotto, fish risotto in the morning. And it looks like a main course dish, which you eat at dinner, but actually Kajri is had in the, with breakfast. And that's because with fresh fish, it came in the morning and there was no refrigeration. So any fresh fish dish was eaten early, earlier in the day. Okay, whereas the meat dish, you could, you could kill the animal later in the day and make a, make a, make a dish later. Anyway, back to this. So. You know, I'm just trying to get you a flavor of what this market is like and why there is an inefficiency in the market. So the inefficiency in the market is because of the way markets are spatially distributed and how it's difficult to get from one market to another. So fishermen coming back have to make a decision of which market they want to go to. So you have a range of markets, you have three markets in this, so you have, three markets here, which have excess supply. Then you have a range of markets where the market's clearing, the supply and the demand clears. And what that means is that the supply and the demand are equal. And when supply and demand are equal, there is a price, right? And the price is reflective of, you know, kind of the price at which the fishermen and the fish merchants are ready to sell this fish and the price at which uh, the, the people who demand the consumers are ready to buy it. Then you have a third range of markets where there's excess demand, where people would turn back. Why would they turn back? The reason they would turn back was because there was not enough fish, right? So they turned back. In these markets where there's excess demand, the price is not a reflection of anything because the price doesn't reflect anything. 
because the people who were not able to buy the fish were ready to pay a higher price, but they were not, they were ready to pay a higher price, but they didn't get a fish. Now it turns out when we think about this in a normal, you know, kind of developed markets sense, what happens is the prices go up, then the suppliers start supplying more of that good. When the prices go down, it is an indication that suppliers have to supply less, right? So if everyone in Britain today started demanding more bananas and de demanding less apples, the price of bananas would go up, the price of the uh, apples would relatively go down, the suppliers would get an indication and they will you know, cut back the supply of apples and increase the supply of bananas. But it turns out this is not possible here because every day the market is clearing, right? So every day the market is clearing and what happens in a market at that point in time, that information is very difficult to ascertain from the previous, previous port, uh, pattern because there is a lot of volatility in what happens in the market, right? Now, this is also because at any point in time in a market, the supply is a stock, it's not a flow. So we've talked about stock and flow. Stock is water in a pond, it's a stock. Water, when it flows through the river, it's a flow. So most outputs that are produced, so when we're looking at the solar growth model, when we were looking, we, were, we thought of output as a flow produced by labor working with the stock of capital, right? So the, the flow of outputs produced in the economy is a flow. But turns out here, the amount of fish produced from the sea or you know, fish from the sea is also a flow. But because of this particular condition of space being separated, it becomes a stock. The supply becomes a stock, right? At a point in time. Okay. And you know, this example that we're talking about is, is not just about a fish market. It's very representative of what happens in markets uh, across developing countries. And as we go further, you will see where infrastructure pops in. So basically the idea here is infrastructure makes the market work more efficiently. Okay, back to this. So it turns out, uh, by the way, the way I've been doing these notes, um, there were this, this uh, particular graph needed some explanation. I've explained that, but I've also written, uh, notes, and these are basically not part of the slides. There are some comments at the back, which will help you understand the slide better, okay? Right, so now this is, we've already talked about it. Wherever in the market there was excess supply, the price, average price was zero. Wherever there was excess demand, the average price was 9.3, uh, but that doesn't tell you anything about the market because it doesn't tell you how high a price the people who were turned away would be ready to pay. But what you, what you do know is that the average price is 5.9. The average price is 5.9 in markets where there was market clearing. Okay. Now, it turns out the reason this is an interesting study is because this was done at a point in time when mobile phones were being introduced to that area. Right, and you can immediately see the advantage of a mobile phone. The advantage of a mobile phone is, as a fisherman, when you're coming back, you can just use your phone to find out what the supply conditions are in each market. And as you're coming back, if you decide to go to one particular market, and you know you check in at some point, um, halfway through to the market and you find out actually there's excess supply, you can divert yourself and go to another market quite easily. So mobile phones increase the flow of information that is required to collect the conditions of excess demand and excess supply, okay? And so mobile phones change the nature of markets in that way because they are able to ensure that there's free flow of freer flow of information between the suppliers and the people who demand. Now, when we think of mobile phones, we think of the notion of transaction cost and the transaction cost, a definition of transaction cost, I have it later in, the, in one of the notes, the definition of transaction cost is what is the cost 
of trading in a particular market, right? So it's not the cost of producing something, it's the cost of trading. So the cost of trading for fishermen, the cost of trading, the transaction cost was almost infinite because there was just no way without the mobile phone that they could acquire contemporaneous information about prices in that particular market. Now with the mobile phone, the cost of acquiring that information falls down to basically pennies. Now, the reason why this is also helpful is because the mobile phone was not introduced in all areas at the same time. There was a sequential rollout of the mobile phone coverage where region one got it in, region one got it in on January 31st, 1997. Uh, region two, uh, there was more coverage on July. And then region three, uh, it got it in May, right? So region one, region two, and then region three. That was a sequential rollout. And so what we can see is what happened to the average market price, uh, what happened to the average market price as the mobile phones were rolled out. And, you know, the figures are quite striking. So mm -hmm. this is what it looks like. So if you look at region one, this volatile area here, is before uh, mobile phones were introduced. And this region here is after the uh, mobile phones were introduced. And the thing that you notice immediately is that the volatility of price goes down because the wastage that used to occur because of excess demand and excess supply starts disappearing and the market prices seem to kind of converge along a much smaller band. So, you know, zero is no longer an option. So if you look in the yellow area before mobile phones, zero was always an option, right? So zero was always an option because that was a period of excess supply. And prices went relatively high. And at some point when the prices went relatively high in these markets, um, in these, the average of these markets, uh, that reflected excess demand. But there's no excess demand or excess supply once the mobile phones are added. And the reason this is a robust result is because, you know, this is not just a coincidence, something else is not driving it, is because we can see this pattern in all three regions. As soon as you introduce mobile phones, as soon as you introduce mobile phones, the price volatility goes down, okay? Now, the important thing to remember here is price volatility is a huge problem for businesses because businesses tend to, you know, especially small businesses tend to be risk averse. Large businesses have, large businesses have access to credit. Large businesses also have retained earnings. So their ability to bear volatility is much higher. But if you're a small business, volatility, price volatility can just drive you bankrupt. So you are very, very sensitive. So as price stabilizes, what also tends to happen, which we don't see here, is that as price stabilizes, there'll be a greater supply of people who get involved in fishing. And the reason is simply this, given the probable before the mobile phones, given the probability of hitting excess supply and getting no price for your fish that day, the only people who could fish were people who could cushion that blow, right? So you've borne the cost of fuel and the labor cost, or opportunity cost of labor to go out and fish that day and you come back and you get zero. So that means you have to dig deep into your pocket to cover that cost. So only people who could cover that cost could become fishermen, but once pay prices start stabilizing and so you start getting a relatively stable prices, the risk of making a loss on a particular day goes away. And so more people start getting involved and poorer and poorer entrepreneurs can become fisher fishermen and fisherwomen. So the results that we have is that, sorry, the results that we have is that, uh, you know, Jensen's paper, and it's a very nicely published paper. So it's published in one of the top journals. Um, 
it finds that there is a sharp decrease in there's a sharp decrease in volatility of price. There is a reduction of waste in uh, waste. Fishermen's profit went up by eight percent, and consumers' prices went down by four percent. Now, if there was ever a definition of Pareto efficiency improvement, this is it. So, what's the notion of Pareto improvement? Pareto improvement is when you can make somebody better off without making anybody worse off. And in this case, everyone's better off, right? All you needed was the mobile phone, the technology, but technology is not enough. As we'll see, mobile phones require a regulatory framework, right? So mobile phones is not just about technology. What you require to establish a mobile phone is you need a particular regulatory framework, which means there are some mobile operators who come in and they are ready to invest because they think the framework would allow them to conduct the business properly. If the regulatory framework is not properly, properly done, uh, these mobile operators would not be ready to operate. Now, the reason I've also written notes is because I'm going to do the next section where we decide, where we'll define what is a private good and what is a public good. And that definition is key to understanding what's public capital and private capital. And it's the definition is slightly more involved. If you've done economics before, you may have come across this definition, but it's a slightly more involved definition. And it would be very useful to kind of go and look at these, this example of the market after you've understood what public goods are. And so the notes that I've written would be helpful for you to look back at this after the lecture and then understand what the role of public good. Why is mob are mobile phones, privately owned mobile phone networks, public goods? Okay. So this is the thing, please do read it after we finish the lecture. So the notion of efficiency, market efficiency is, Okay, let's talk about it improvement. So if you can make somebody better off without making anybody worse off, that's a Pareto improvement. And in this case, both the people who sell fish and the people who consume fish are better off and nobody's worse off, right? So it's very difficult to find anybody who's worse off uh, because of these mobile phones. Um, and obviously the mobile phones are not being publicly subsidized. So mobile phones, everyone's paying for um, the use of the mobile phone services. And in spite of the fact that they're paying for this service, it still improves the efficiency. So this takes us to this idea, which goes back a long while, long back, it goes to Adam Smith's insight about markets. Now, I'll talk a little bit about what Adam Smith was saying. And the reason I think it's useful is because when you consume Adam Smith, uh, through the popular narrative, the nuance of what Adam Smith is, was saying gets lost. And so I wanna kind of go over what Adam Smith was saying and why market and Pareto efficiency are interlinked. So what Adam Smith was saying was this, forget about the institutions, forget about any of the kind of trappings. Just imagine a world in which there are a bunch of people who can produce something and there are a bunch of people who, who, can, who, who are ready to pay for it. Now, try to think of a system which, where you would allocate goods from the suppliers to the people who are demanding. And then you try to figure out what price should be paid uh, from, from the people who consume them to the people who supplied them. Now, what would the definition of efficiency be in this? You know, and so we're not thinking about markets, we're just thinking about allocation mechanism. Think of NHS, think of you know, how goods, you know, how, how you allocate resources within your household. Think of how the food is allocated within the household. What is the definition of Pareto efficiency? The definition of Pareto efficiency is that basically all mutually beneficial traits are undertaken. That means a trade that can make somebody worse, better off without making anybody worse off is not left. So all opportunities for trade are exploited. And that's the definition of Pareto efficiency. Now what Adam Smith was saying, and you know, he was saying this at a time when um, the mercantilist 
So if you go back to the history of economic thought, um, you go back to a time when mercantilists, and these were people, uh, mercantilist school of thought was dominant, and these are people who thought that the government was really important for determining, we're talking about 200 years ago, were really important in driving the economy and making it work properly. And Adam Smith at that point comes in and says that, you know, the definition of a efficiency is Pareto efficiency. He was, he didn't use the word efficiency, but that's what his text says. And he says, markets can lead you to efficiency. And the reason why this was a really, really counterintuitive thought was because people were thinking of the world as a centralized place where some centralized authority, the government or the local warlord or the local feudal lord would decide who does what, right? And what Adam Smith says is that without centralization, with a decentralized where individuals make choices, they can ensure that all trades, so they, you know, if they don't have a problem finding all the people who are ready to trade with them, they can exploit all opportunities of trade. And once all the opportunities of trade have been exploited, you reach a stage of efficiency. Now, how would the centralized power get you to efficiency? They will have to extract all the information from the people who are demand and the people who supply, and then work out all the trades and move things. And you know, there is a lot of problem in extracting information and the process of extracting information itself is a costly process. Whereas here, basically all the buyers and suppliers go and find each other and they exploit all mutually um, beneficial trade. The key bit here is that they have to find each other. So if the suppliers and you know, kind of people, consumers are able to find each other in close proximity and, you know, move from person to person and say, do you want this? What price are you ready to pay for this? The market would become efficient. But the key bit is how difficult is it to find a person? How difficult, if you are, you have something to sell, how difficult is it to find all the people who are ready to buy? And that notion, the process of finding, how costly it is, is called transaction cost. So what is the cost of finding people who are ready to buy things from you? So when there is high transaction cost, that lowers the efficiency of the market. And then there are some other issues that makes the market, you know, kind of not function properly. And these are if there is market power. So the idea of a market power is that if there is a monopolist or there are a bunch of suppliers who are the only ones who can sell this, then the markets don't work properly. So for the market to work properly, you have to have a lot of suppliers and a lot of consumers, and all of them should be small. No one should be able to influence the market. So that's one condition. The second condition is there should be no information problem. The idea of information problem is that if, you're trying to sell me. So I go to the market, uh, uh, farmer's market and you're on the stall and you're trying to sell me oranges. So I look at those oranges and I say, how much do you want for these oranges? And you say, it's one pound an orange. And you say, it's great. Now the problem for me is that I'm looking at the orange and I don't have information about the quality of the orange. I don't know how good it is, you know, how, you know, I can smell it, but I still don't know um, how good or bad it is and whether I value it more than a pound or less than a pound. And so if I don't know, what would I do? I might not buy it. And if I don't buy it, the other people may not buy it because they are not able to ascertain the quality of what they're trying to buy. And if other two people don't buy, you as a seller don't exist and the market disappears. So there are lots and lots of markets that just don't exist because there's an information problem. Now, this was discussed for the first time or this was written about for the first time in 1970 uh, by somebody called Akerlof. And uh, 
he basically wrote this simple paper who's, which said markets collapse is this information problem. Uh, and his example was secondhand cars. So he said in his paper, he says, and this, so it's a famous paper called, called Market for Lemons. And this is because secondhand cars are called lemons in the US. It's an American paper. And he basically said, if you want to buy a secondhand car, you want to find out the quality of the car. You don't know whether it's a secondhand car, which will stop once you drive it for 100 miles, or it's a car in excellent condition. So you don't have an information. So if you buy, try to buy a car and somebody says it's $1,000, because you don't have information of the quality of the car, you're not going to buy it, and the market would not exist. Now, we all buy things all the time, right? So we buy all buy things at the time. And what we take for granted, you know, I'm talking to a middle-class audience here, and you know, most of you are in middle-income companies or countries or developed countries. So you may not take, you realize how much information you acquire before you buy something. So if you go into your local supermarket, the local supermarket is ensuring that you have that information because that's their brand. So the local supermarket is saying, if you buy goods from us, we guarantee a certain amount of, certain amount of, um, certain amount, certain quality of the good. When you go to the farmer's market, from the farmer, you don't have uh, the same quality. And this is one of the reasons why there are lots and lots of farmers who are not able to sell their goods, even in a developed country, and they have to sell their goods to, um, to the supermarkets. And the supermarkets, you know, they always complain the supermarkets are exploiting them because supermarkets have market power. So this supermarkets are giving us information, but the fact that they're giving us information also gives them a market power, okay? And if you were talking about this in terms of a developed country, it would have gone off in a different correct direction. But here I wanna want to, want to point out is that all the trappings of a well-functioning market that we are used to means that information problems and transaction cost have been solved. And the, one of the key things to ensure that there is enough economic activity in the developed country is getting the markets working. working. And in the rest of the lecture, what I want to talk about is the role of public capital in ensuring that the markets are able to stumble, if not work. The last bit is uh, that markets also don't work if they're externalities. And what that basically means is that externality means that transaction between two people, trade between two people, has an impact on a third party who's unrelated. And so the reason why markets don't work is because if it has a negative impact on somebody that is not being priced into the trade, right? So that is not being priced into the trade. So when an individual buys a cigarette from the cigarette manufacturer, um, they pay the price for the cigarette, they consume the cigarette, but due to passive smoking, if somebody has a negative effect, that negative effect is not part of the transaction. And then, that means that you can actually make the person who's having a negative effect because of smoking better off, right? By charging these people the right price. So it's no longer efficient because somebody's getting worse off due to that trade, okay? We'll come back to externalities again. And you know, the best example of this externality is carbon, right? So the environmental problem that we all face. The environmental problem that we that we face is we are all over consuming fossil fuels because the price that we pay for fossil fuel doesn't reflect its impact in the society. And so the market is not efficient. It may be well functioning in a kind of colloquial sense, but from an economic perspective, it's not very too efficient. Okay. Any questions? I'm just uh, I'm gonna take this into, and so let me just, you know, kind of connect this to what we've just done. So what we've just done is we've looked at a market, which is a very stylized example, but it reflects the market conditions in most developing countries. 
So in most developing countries, space is a huge problem. So economic activity often takes off in developing countries and urban areas, and urban areas get over the problem of space quite easily. But a typical problem of a developing country is that you live in a rural area. And if you live, let's say, five miles away from the market town, what that basically means is that the cost of going to the market and selling in the market what you produce and then buying what you want to consume is very expensive. Right? Five miles means one day of walking. Right, almost one day of walking, and that's really expensive in terms of, you know, in, in terms of what, you know, what you can what you can do, especially if you're buying, you know, you, you just don't have to go once in a month. You'd have to go on a regular basis. So what we find the pattern that we find in most developing countries is the poorest communities they tend to consume their calories out of grains. So they tend to consume the calories out of grains, you know. So if you go to anybody who lives below the poverty line in any of the developing countries, you would often find that they are consuming calories out of grains, so just wheat or rice, um, and they don't have access to markets which can give them free fresh, fresh food, food and vegetable. The moment you have market access, what happens is that you don't have to, so in the absence of market access, you have to produce not only wheat, but you have to produce everything on your own. You can't specialize because there's no market, you're living in a hamlet of, let's say, you know, 50 people, there is a very limited amount of market, there is a very limited amount of specialization that you can do, you have to produce everything for yourself. And because you're spreading yourself and try to produce everything, uh, you know, you do this, you, 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 you're kind of not doing it at the best possible scale. Whereas if you could just concentrate on producing one thing and selling it to the market and then using that money to buy something, buy a range of things, you'll be much better. And we know from very carefully done studies is that moment people get slightly richer and they have market access, what they do is they start buying um, fresh fruit and vegetables. If they don't have market access and they're relatively poor, they, only, uh, they would only consume grains. And I'll refer to this again, and this in the late 80s uh, was developed into what became known as the first set of models of uh, poverty trap, nutritional poverty trap, uh, by a professor in Cambridge called Professor Apartha Das Gupta. And so that paper, original paper is fascinating to read. And that base, the paper basically said this, that if you are consuming, producing everything that you consume, so that means you know, you're trying to get to your adequate number of calories by consuming wheat. That means you have nutritional deficiencies. You may not be getting enough calories, but even if you are getting enough calories, you have nutritional deficiencies, which reduces your capacity to work, which in turn reduces the amount of food that you're producing, which in turn reduces your capacity to work. And so you become malnourished, right? And so simple introduction of market means that you can produce something and instead of just consuming wheat, you can consume fresh fruit and vegetable, which gives you vitamins, which increases your nutritional, um, nutritional kind of status and makes you a more efficient worker, right? So now I'm just putting this in the context of development that market access is extremely important. And most people's exposure to developing countries is urban areas. So, you know, if people visit India, they visit Delhi. If people visit Kenya, they go to Nairobi. And that is a relatively small part of a developing country. Large populations in developing country live in rural areas. That's where poverty is. That's where the development trap is. And market access is one of those creaky ingredients uh, that is not appreciated if you look at this in kind of the wider narrative. Okay, uh, and you know, you can see how market access and what we are interested in, the role of infrastructure and development gets keyed in. But there are a couple of other things that I wanna talk about. So water bodies have been crucial. If you look at economic history, 
water bodies have been crucial in looking at urban agglomerations with developed markets and became thriving societies. So if you look at Venice, so if you ever go to Venice, the fascinating thing about Venice is um, that the cost of moving goods across the city of Venice was literally nothing. And the cost of getting things to Venice was literally nothing at a time when moving things across space was extremely expensive, right? So you, you, had, to, you had to take animals and then use the animals to drive the cart and you take goods over the cart, you'll move slowly, you'll get robbed along the way. Whereas water bodies were these really easy to move surfaces and they were easy to move surfaces and the cost of transaction cost, if you had a water body, went down to almost negligible, right? And so Venice in the West and Varanasi, the city of Varanasi in the East are examples. So Varanasi is again a city that's based all along the river. And so that you could move things from one end of the city to the other end of the city using the water body. And I'm talking at that time before, before uh, fossil fuel, um, fossil fuel intensive vehicles and before proper roads, water bodies became, were excellent places which allowed you to reduce the transaction cost. And so it's not surprising that we see the development, early development of communities and prosperity along water bodies. So, you know, it's not surprising that most, uh, you know, centers centers of uh, prosperity even today are next to water bodies right so new york london you, you know uh, new york london uh, you can you know you can go on and on think of oh, if you don't have a water body next to it chances are that there's a very low probability that you are at an urban center even today and you know suez canal and erie canal erie canal is an example that we've talked about uh, and i'm going to talk about it in, again in a sense uh, in a in a in a slide, but Erie Canal changed the, the history of US. It changed the direction of US. So the idea of water bodies is to not think of them as specific contextual things. Think of them as automated surfaces. And so you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are automated surfaces. And this here is absolutely the frontier of um, research. So people think of uh, 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 our People, when they think of infrastructure, infrastructure is thought of in terms of, I know what is infrastructure. How do I define infrastructure? Well, no clue, right? So, you know, how do I know something is infrastructure and something is not? Um, if I go to, if I go to Ula Pool in Scotland and I find a shop in the middle of nowhere, is that a private, is that a private shop or is that infrastructure? People who live around the shop will call it infrastructure. Uh, but you, if you think shops are not infrastructure, will not think it's infrastructure. So what I want is the kind of primitive, kind of primitive definition of infrastructure. And within that, automated surfaces, the notion of automated surfaces become really important. So what is the notion of automated surface? Automated surface is a surface along which you can move really easily. Sometimes that's because of the nature of the surface and water basically no friction, you can move easily. In other cases, like roads, they become automated surfaces where you can move easily because there are some rules that are imposed to make them, uh, make them easy to move along. So if you're on the road, what is the rule that makes it easy? The rude rules, that means that you drive on the left or the right, you follow certain rules so that you don't have accidents. If you have accidents, suddenly that becomes an inefficient surface. So the process of automation here is say, taking away an individual's discretion and replacing it with a bunch of rules. So the automation process is that. The other extreme example of a road, you know, automation of surface, which is even more automated is the railway line. What does a railway line do? It commits the vehicle to a particular track so the vehicle has no decision to make. And because it's committed to a particular track, you can make it go even further and further. And as we go into automated cars, the key problem that's happening 
is that automated cars work really well with other automated cars, but automated cars don't work well with humans because humans make mistakes. So, so if you wanted to create an automated surface and make automated vehicles, what you'd have to do largely is get the humans out. So we are in a transition phase where humans are still driving cars and humans make mistakes. So if you actually go back, go and look at uh, the Google experience, Google cars experience, what you find is Google cars only have had accidents when humans make mistakes because Google cars are very good at predicting you know, they're good at following rules. They're good at understanding the surrounding, but what they're not very good at is predicting when the humans will jump the red light or make a mistake. But if you think about it, the reason why we have roads which allow us to travel is because part of it is a physical characteristic, which is allows us to flow in a particular way. But also another part of it is that we have been automated as individuals on those roads. We can't do what we want to. We are trained to do follow a certain set of rules and that makes the automated process. So automated surfaces are surfaces where it's very easy to move things across from one place to another. And these automated surfaces are crucial and automated circuits are railway lines, uh, railway lines, um, rivers, uh, the railway lines, labels, rails. Now, the reason why automated surfaces are really critical is because water, automated surfaces change the nature of space around us. So for a second, I'm gonna talk about this French tradition of philosophy. So the French tradition of philosophy in the 1960s were thinking very hard about how the human experiential space works. So this is not part of your course, and the reason this is not part of your course is because this is not something where, which is, it's, it's still in this philosophy tradition and it's part of one of my research projects um, of how to bring that philosophy tradition to understand the nature of space, right? So I have some written stuff on it, but it's still quite preliminary and nothing that I can, you know, kind of formally give to you. But I can give you the intuition of, um, intuition of where I'm going with this. So if you remember, uh, the Gilets Jean protest of the, in France, uh, was it a year ago or was it two, two years ago? The protest in the France by Gilets Jean, these yellow West people was against petrol hikes and against high prices being charged for the fuel. And now, you know, often there's a scene as people who are out of touch, people who are against climate change, you know, the same narrative that you have for Trump voters. Uh, but as somebody who's spent a lot of time in France and have, have relatives in France and in rural areas of France, I could see it from their perspective. And their perspective was that even those rural areas of France might feel like really free areas, they were actually very claustrophobic. And the reason they were very claustrophobic was because the only way you can get from one place to another in a rural area in France, you know, so the only way you can get to the next supermarket or the next marketplace is through cars. And the price of fuel has increased consistently in the last 15, 15 years as we are using the price of fuel to fight climate change. Now, their grief is that in urban areas, there is a lot of public transport, really cheap to travel. They don't need the cars. But for us, car is about getting from one place to another. And if every year prices keep going up and in the last, you know, kind of last few years, the price keeps going up. And that means it's just reducing our mobility and reducing our ability to do something. And that's claustrophobia because you know, you're caught up in your place and you know, everything is far away, right? And everything is far away because price of petrol is going up. And so the French tradition talks about how space is not something which is given physically. Um, human experiential space is 
how easily we can move across space. And that de is determined by, you know, automated surfaces. Where can I take a road? How costly is it to take a road? Where can I take a rail? Where can I fly? So it turns out, uh, you know, it may turn out that, uh, you know, if you're in London, going to, you can get to New York faster uh, than you can get to kind of one of the islands in Scotland, right? And so there, the human experiential space is being determined by your transport links. And the transport links are part of what the government has done or what the society has done, right? Okay, I'll define public goods and I'll come back to this. But thinking of space and naturally automated spaces or artificially automated space, how automated spaces change the nature of nature of um, nature of space and the human intervention in changing the nature of space is quite crucial. Now, with this in mind, go back and think about what was happening here in Kerala. What was happening here in Kerala was actually getting from one market to another was quite easy. All that was missing was information. Most rural areas, you know, where kind of economic activity is confined in developing countries, you don't have that luxury. So most areas have two problems. The first problem is how do I get from one place to another? How good the roads are? You know, can I, you know, can I have, can I get a public transport? No public transport, would I have to walk? Would I have to cycle? And the second bit is information. And the beauty of this paper is that space is not a problem because it's on a water body. This market is on a water body. And so it pins down the role of information. So in most cases, the, the role of, you know, the role of space is that it separates you from other people who are ready to trade with you and you don't have information. And so there's a lovely paper that I'll do right at the end of lecture, uh, you know, at, at the end of the lectures in lecture five uh, by somebody called David Donaldson, who talks about how railways changed the Indian market in 1800s and how railways determined the pattern of prosperity in India or the lack of prosperity, okay? So the key thing here is there are two different issues. Transaction cost, how do I get through space? and get to find somebody who is ready to trade with me. And if I can easily find people who are ready to trade with me, markets will start becoming efficient and you don't need to th think from outside. You can allow people to make transactions and they'll get to best, party, best outcome. And the outcome that they get to, you can't improve because it's very to efficiency. So the role of space in that and the role of information in that. Okay, any questions? at this stage. Let me just check the chat. So this paper um, is described in the Cori context and that I've set out. You can, I've also linked it as deep dive reading. If you want, you can read it, but you don't have to. So given all this, you can understand how crucial Erie Canal is when it opened in 1825. And if you follow economic, you know, the pattern of economic prosperity in, um, in United States, even today, this connects the most prosperous areas. So once areas become prosperous and they became prosperous because you could easily move goods along the Erie Canal, once it became prosperous, uh, those areas have remained um, prosperous. So it cut down the cost of transport by 95%. Now, most people, when they think of infrastructure, they think of corruption. And you know, corruption is an issue, but it's a trivial issue. And the reason it's a trivial issue is because if you read the reference I have on the Erie Canal, Erie Canal's construction was extremely corrupt. People made a lot of money. It was really done in an improper way. Huge corruption. But the extent of that corruption pales in insignificance compared 
the, the prosperity that that area has seen in the last 200 years. So corruption is a moral issue. It's, you know, it's, it's terrible, you know, but if the corruption allows you to grease the wheels and to construct something which is critical, uh, corruption is not an issue. So what I'm trying to say here is that most people think that infrastructure development, the problem of infrastructure development in developing countries is corruption. Turns out corruption is not what keeps it back. What keeps it back is something else, which is what I'll do towards the end of the lecture, you know, kind of uh, there's some other. But corruption is an important issue, right? From a moral perspective, from, a, from an economic perspective, if you think of the amount of corruption and the inflated cost of the Erie Canal, you know, it just disappeared compared to the prosperity that area has experienced since then. Now, you either have automated for all, so, so this kind of, um, this kind of summarizes the, the ideas in this section. So well-functioning markets are crucial for development. Why are they crucial? But it allows you to produce what you're best at and buy from other people who produced what you want to consume. And it allows people to specialize and produce whatever they're good at. And so basically you can get the best possible price for what you produce and use the money that you get to buy a range of things at reasonable prices. Right? So the one of the first thing that happens whenever there is, you have access to market is that you start getting things at reasonable prices. So there are natural automated surfaces, but the human intervention or development process is creating roads and railways, uh, roads and railways, and that requires fiscal capacity. So the notion of fiscal capacity is, and the definition is at the bottom in the footnote, fiscal capacity is a country's capacity to tax economic activity. So the capacity to tax economic activity, that's really important because if you're a developing country, you may not be able to tax the economic activity. Even developed countries struggle to tax economic activity, right? So try getting Apple and Amazon to pay your taxes. It's not easy because for every, you know, kind of every kind of government capacity, government capacity that you have, Amazon and Apple have higher government capacity and they find loopholes where they don't have to tax, pay taxes. The same problem exists in developing countries, which is one is you need to have an infrastructure to be able to tax. And the second thing is you wanna close off all the avenues, all the leakages. Then there is a related but important component is that do you have a capacity to spend it in a productive way? So you may be able to tax a lot, but can you spend it in a productive way? Do you have a capacity to spend on public goods, conceptualize the project, visualize where the needs are? And you know, I'll, we'll see a very good example of what happened to road construction in Kenya um, in the last 50 years. And part of it is the government's ability to conceptualize where the road, road was needed the most was compromised. So fiscal capacity has two components. One is, can you tax? So is there economic activity? Can you tax the economic activity? And do you have a way to identify what is the right public good? What is the kind of right public good? Okay. And so the constraint is often the fiscal capacity. What that basically means is that most developing countries don't have enough fiscal capacity. What that basically means is the most developing countries either don't have enough tax revenues and those tax revenues may not be there for two reasons. One is there's not enough economic activity. Um, the second reason could be there's economic activity but you just cannot tax it. So an example of this that comes to mind, and this is a really lovely book, if you want the reference, I can give you uh, of how piracy was organized in Somalia. Uh, 
and how piracy was organized and was a very profitable business where you as an individual living in Somalia could buy a share into a firm that did the piracy. But because Somalia lacked the kind of fiscal capacity, it was not able to tax that economic activity. It had, if it had been able to tax that economic activity and use it to produce the right kind of public goods, it would have encouraged people to away from piracy into something which was more legal. So you could have transition. But the Somalian government did not have a capacity. And there's this lovely book by a guy called Jay Bahadur who spent time with the Somali pirates. And he basically finds that it's a very well-organized firm. The firms that were running piracy were very well organized. So back to the fiscal capacity, the idea of fiscal capacity is that you need fiscal capacity to be able to tax, have enough tax revenues, then use that to get the right kind of public goods. And these public goods are classified as public capital and that's what we do next. So what's the definition of public goods and public capital? Okay, so when it comes to a good, so you know, these are just like Pareto efficiency, I need the definition of a public good. And when people use the word public good colloquially, they mean something else. In economics, we have very clear definitions. And these, you know, just the way when you, have, when you have new words that emerge, they mean different things to different people, right? So, and unless and until we all agree that we are talking about the same thing, communication will never work. So colloquial usage of the word will have to distinguish from the economic usage of the word. And we, you know, this is not because you, know, you need to somehow kind of you know, use it. It's just that it makes communication more eff efficient. So public goods are defined by two criteria in economics. One is rivalry. And the idea of rivalry is simply this, that if two goods, if goods are rival, that means that if you're having a cup of tea, I can't have it. And if I'm having a cup of tea, you can't have it. So goods that are rival, if one person's consuming it, the other person cannot consume it. So that's the rivalry. I mean, most economic definitions do not have really, really good you know, intuitive terminology. So it's kind of a bit of a damage. Uh, it's a bit of a uh, shame. But the word rivalry here simply means that consumption in individuals is rival. So like food, public food, public gardens, space in a bus, education, law and order, they can often be rival, right? Whereas non-rival things are air, water and smell, right? So if I breathe, this, breathe air, it doesn't stop you from breathing it. If I use, if I sit by a water, by next to a river, enjoy the, the view of the river, it doesn't stop you from enjoying the same, same view. So rivalry is one criteria. The second criteria that we need to think of is excludability. So the notion of excludability is, can a person, can a person be excluded from benefiting from a certain good? Either naturally or through an artificial process. Right, so excludable is, can somebody be excluded from consuming something? So um, think, of, uh, think of the role of patents. Patents is an, a patent is an idea or innovation. And usually an idea is non-rival, right? If you use the idea to do something, I can use the idea at the same time, it's non rival It's usually not excludable because if you're using the idea, you can't stop me from using that idea. But patents is an artificial contrived mechanism of making it excludable. If you, that means that certain people who have the right to use it can use it, other people who don't have the right cannot use it. So again, think of what is excludable food is it excludable? Well, if you have flu food in your house, it's excludable because nobody's allowed to get in. But if you leave, leave the food in a public garden, it's not excludable. It's not rival, it's, it's, it's rival, but it's not excludable. Um, an example that often I think of when I think of 
you know, the relationship between rivalry and non-excludability is an example of a garden. So let's imagine you have a house and you have a beautiful garden in front of the house. Um, now, aspects of that garden is rival, aspects of the garden are non-rival. So the aspects that are rival are, if you wanna sit in the garden and it's a small garden, if you're sitting there, nobody else can sit. It's a small garden. It's a beautiful, but small garden. So using the garden, sitting in the garden is rival, but looking at the garden is non-rival, right? So if you're looking at the garden from the street and other person is looking at the garden, you know, it's largely non-rival. Now, is it excludable? Well, if you have a boundary around, it's excludable. So you can't use it. But what if you wanted to exclude somebody from looking at a beautiful flaws in the garden, which is another aspect of the garden? You can make it excludable by building walls, right? So the view of the garden is non, non rival but you can build a wall around it and make it excludable. So you can exclude people from the view of the beautiful garden and the, and the flowers, but you would struggle very hard to exclude people from the smell of the garden. So if there are beautiful flowers, there's a jasmine tree, it's almost impossible for you, given technology, to make exclude people from the smell of the garden. And so technology here often plays a very crucial role where we think of roads, so we think of roads as being non-rival. So if you're traveling on a road, it stop, doesn't stop me from using the road to travel. Um, but when it comes to excludability, in UK, um, we don't exclude people from motorways. And what that basically means is anybody can use the motorway. You have to just pay your road tax. It's just not about the motorways, but if you pay road tax, you can use roads in UK and you can use the motorways. But the French use the same motorways and exclude people because on French motorways, you have to pay to use the motorway. So the same non-rival road has been made excludable in, 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 in France, but is non-excludable in UK. Okay, now let's take all these examples together and understand what we mean by public goods. So these are just examples. Uh, so as we said, so, uh, as we said, food and housing on, on this quadrant is rivalrous and excludable. And then you have examples of a local, a local thing in an area like a pond. So local thing in an area like a pond, which may be rivalrous, but non-excludable. So every, every Eng English um, village or town has a common and common was a common green space in that, in, 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 in that city, or, uh, city or village. And there is a long philosophical tradition of trying to understand how to use that common efficiently. Because in the past, commons were used to graze your cattle or graze your animals. And if you overgrows it, that means other people cannot use it to graze their animals. So that means that they were rivalrous, but the problem was their commons are access to everyone, so they were non-excludable, right? So that's one category. Then you have goods which are naturally non-rival and they could be excludable or non-excludable. And that excludability could be a natural excludability or could be an artificial excludability. So, you know, terrestrial television, uh, you know, television that you get to an antenna to a large extent is, uh, has, has always been non-excludable, but when cable television came, they used technology to exclude people. So non-rival goods, so non-rival goods, whether it's excludable or non-excludable depends on technology that you have available to exclude people, or sometimes things are naturally um, excludable. Now there are different definitions of uh, the different the, these. All these four things are called different things. So pure private goods, sorry. So pure private goods are simply, you know, simply 
So pure private goods are simply goods that we consume and buy from the supermarket. And often markets for pure private goods is easy because, right? Because uh, they're excludable, they're rivalrous, no problem. Now you can imagine that something that's non-excludable, you can't create a market. And the reason you can't create a market is if you can't exclude people from it, that means anybody can use it. So why would anybody pay a price, right? So anything that's non-excludable cannot have a market. So this, Bottom area, everything that is a pure public good or a common pool resources cannot have a market. So you can have a market here, but this you cannot have a market. So when it comes to non rival things, they are pure public goods. And you know, the example of a pure public good is a national defense. You can't exclude people from national defense. Um, it's non-excludable and it's also non-rival. If you have national defense for your country, if you have a robust national defense, you have a military, uh, uh, you have uh, defense forces that defend your country, everyone gets it, right? And so then comes the category of club goods. And the club goods are Basically, club goods are basically goods where they are non-rival, but you have created an artificial exclusion. So basically created a club. So everyone in a club can use it, but everyone who's not part of a club cannot use it. Most things that get congestion, most things that get congestion um, are often also in this category. Okay. So now you can see where we're going. Uh, if you need a public, uh, you need a, public, a pure public good or common pool resource, you can't create a market. And the market that you create out of public goods is dependent on what is allowed and what te technology permits, so the role of the government starts becoming, so the role of the government starts becoming critical. So the role of the government starts becoming critical in this batch. So this batch is market, no problem, but the other three spaces are, you need some role of the government or fiscal capacity. Can anybody guess where mobile phone networks fit into this? Does anybody want to give it a try? Where would mobile phone networks fit into this? Are mobile phone networks club goods, essentially? Well, so my okay, network, so Vodafone, is a club because I've joined it to use Vodafone. You might have joined, I don't know, EE, and that's your club. But then the more broad infrastructure that sits above all of that, so the cell towers and the spectrum, it's a common pool resource, but the government manages somehow to control access to it through licensing and stuff. So that's a bit... So, uh, so the way I'd put it is that your transaction with Vodafone or any of the other networks is a pure private transaction, right? right? But you're absolutely right that it sets on a regulatory framework. That regulatory framework is a public good, mm. right? And you cannot get access to that regulatory framework unless and until you pay the auction prices. So it's excludable, but that regulatory framework itself is non-rival. Mm. So the interesting thing that happens here is that the government sets the regulatory framework, which is a public good. It says, if you pay the action auction prices, you can have access to this public good. And the private capital formation is complementary to the public good. So if you do not establish that regulatory framework, 
you would not have private private capital yeah. formation. And the same thing applies for health and safety law. So, you know, the best example that I think of is if you go to developing countries, you're told often not to have ice cream from street vendors. But in UK, you don't have a problem. Why? Because in UK, if I buy an ice cream from a street vendor or a small shop, I can be guaranteed that there's no bacteria in it because health and safety ensures, right? That everyone, everyone, um, everyone, all the, all the production, um, food production um, uh, premises are clean, which means that I'll go and buy it. Whereas in a developing country, I'll only buy where I can be sure that it's free from bacteria, which is usually a large firm, which is ready to create a brand and certi certify this. So the interesting thing is that the health and safety law is a tiny regulatory framework but once you establish that as a public good, it influences the formation of private investment. Without that, so you know what the public good do, is doing here is solving the information problem which destroys the market. With the information problem, nobody would ever buy, you know, so in developing countries, you often struggle, and especially in really, really poor countries, you st um, struggle to find markets for food where you know, you're getting in, you know, you're getting food poisoning out of food is a possibility. And as a result, there's not enough investment, there's no regulatory framework, but the moment you put a regulatory framework, you draw in people who are ready to use that regulatory framework to build. And so in this sense, when we think of capital, we often think of capital as something physical. So there's public capital and private capital. And so the idea of public capital is, something that's publicly owned. So if a road is publicly owned, that's public capital. If you have a house that is privately owned or a shop that's privately owned, that's private capital. But the regulatory frameworks, the system of law, the system of property rights, you know, how do you resolve disputes? These are as much part of the public capital because they are a stock. And once you establish a constitution, once you establish a regulatory framework, you've established a stock. So they're as much part of a public good. And you know, it's a public good is a type of a good, which is public capital. And so we often obsess about the role of physical things that we can see, but that physical things do not come up unless and until the kind of primitive goods that come up. So the notion of capital or the notion of goods is a layered concept. Okay, a little more on this. So let's think about what property rights are. So property rights are absolutely crucial. Uh, what do property rights mean? Property rights means it gives you the right to own something. And the question is, what does it mean to own something? So I have this pencil in my hand. If I say this belongs to me, what does that actually mean? Um, if you come, and grab this and walk away with it, how am I gonna establish that this belongs to me, right? Uh, turns out I'd find it very difficult to establish that it belongs to me because I have no paperwork to prove that it belongs to me. When it comes to bigger things, I might have some paperwork, but the paperwork the paper that tells you that something belongs to you only means something if you are able to establish that somewhere and all the disputes related to that are resolved. So the mere notion of ownership is linked to a framework, a legal framework that's created and allows people to own things. And without that, if you don't have that legal framework, what that basically would mean is that ownership depends on your strength on your pure strength or your ability to grab things, right? And without those property rights, if you can't own anything, markets don't exist because if you buy something, somebody can easily take it away from you. Investment doesn't exist because if you invest, somebody can grab it, right? And there is an interesting there's a kind of interesting school of thought, which is called Pigovian economics, which basically says uh, 
that allocation of property rights over the intangible. So we've been talking about property rights over the tangible, this is tangible. But the allocation of property rights over intangible can solve a lot of problems where you have externality. So example of this is um, pollute, pollution, right? So the question is in pollution, if you think about property rights, where does the property rights lie? So as things stands in UK, you're not allowed to pollute, which means that by default, there's a right to clean environment. But in other cases, right? So, you know, if you can't throw garbage on the street, you can't go and throw garbage in a forest. So in that case, you do not have a right to pollute. People have a right to a clean environment, but people do not have a right, right to clean air, right? So when it comes to air pollution using your cars, you have the right to pollute, right? So the fascinating thing is in the same country, uh, in a developed country, in some cases, you have the right to a clean environment. In other cases, you have a right to pollute. And because you have the right to pollute, you're selling goods which are polluting. So property rights are very critical in shaping economic activity. And in that you have to decide who has what kind of a right. And in deciding who has what kind of a right, you can actually you know, kind of encourage economic activity or discourage economic activity, right? And so think about having a dispute with your neighbor about noise late in the night and the question is, does somebody have a right to noise pollute, pollute the pollute with noise, or does somebody have a right to silence? And turns out, in this case, the law says till about eleven o'clock or twelve o'clock, you have a right to pollute with noise. But after twelve o'clock, you have a right to a silent environment so that you can go to sleep. Right. So these regulatory frameworks become very crucial in establishing public goods. Now, I'm gonna add this and I'm gonna to try to take you back to the solo framework. Um, and you know, I'm just setting up definitions and you know, next lecture again, we'll do another set of examples and in lecture five, I'll bring it back all together into a very clear framework using the growth, growth markets. I just wanna mention that Property rights are a lot about social norms, as much about social norms as they are about a regulatory framework. So if you decide as a society that the social norm, so, so the society decides as a social norm uh, that people would not be honest, that means you don't read the regulatory framework, right? So in, in a lot of countries, you, you find that there is some rule about queuing that needs to be enforced. And you know, whenever it's not enforced, people don't queue. Whereas in UK, everyone queues. You don't need a, you don't need a, uh, a law for that. Um, everyone stops at the red light, which means you don't have any stringent laws about people who jump red lights. You don't have a monitoring mechanism. You don't need to reuse your resources in that direction. So one of the interesting things is that it's not like property rights and a regulatory framework is everything. Property rights and regulatory framework is only when the social norms do not, you know, kind of are not conducive to social functioning. And I always think of this ex extremely kind of interesting example. So when I took my first job um, um, 20 years ago at the University of Edinburgh, um, and I said I had a PhD in economics, they didn't need a certificate. Because at that point, if you said you had a PhD in economics or if you had said you'd done a bachelor's, everyone believed you. And then we found that for whatever reason, slowly we started uncovering cases where people were misrepresenting the degree. So till, till early 2000, there's never a, people didn't perceive it as a problem, but there was a systemic pattern where people were Kind of misrepresenting themselves. And now when you apply for a job, you have to show them a certificate. And there is a lot of skepticism if you don't show them a certificate. So it's an extremely interesting example 
It's an interesting example where if there is a social norm and people use those social norms to function, you don't need regulatory frameworks. You only read regulatory frameworks when the social norms do not encourage economic activity. And one of the interesting things, and there is a, there is a, um, there's somebody in the Supreme Court in UK who's just retired, and he has these interesting arguments, I'm forgetting his, forgetting his name, and he basically talks about what legislation government does in terms of crowding out social norms. And I have an interesting, extremely interesting example of this, and I'll try to remember uh, next time to talk about it. I'm slightly running short of time, but there is also interesting balance between are you uh, are government regulations crowding out the social norms or are they encouraging social norms okay we've already talked about this conditions for market to function properly the examples that i used i've just expanded on that when we were talking about adam smith we've already talked about these three conditions public capital so what we did in solo growth model, so and we're trying to connect what we've been talking about. We've been talking about public capital and the role public capital plays in encouraging markets and through markets economic activity, right? So there is that economic, private economic activity aspect of it. But the problem is that private economic activity often doesn't work because the underlying things that you need for private economic activity to work property rights, legal framework, a kind of infrastructure, physical infrastructure, that is often non-rival or non-excludable, right? Now, let's go back to solo growth model and think about in the solo growth model, where is the government, right? And solo growth model is used. So this is the fascinating thing about solo growth model. And you know, this is based on a paper that I've just, just written. Solar growth model is used as the model for development. Everyone who talks about development uses the solar growth model. And the motivation for me writing that paper was, I kept thinking, where is the government in social um, solar growth model? So in solar growth model, what happens is what you don't, so you know, this is, I'm just going over what we've already done in the last couple of weeks. In solar growth model, basically what happens is Output gets divided between output that's consumed and output that's not consumed, right? So output gets divided between output that's consumed and output that's not being consumed. So the output that's not been consumed potentially can be used to form capital. So that becomes private savings. Private savings that get converted into private capital. So these are, this is the market for capital goods, right? So uh, private savings go to banks, banks lend the money to firms, then firms can use that money to buy capital goods and machinery from firms that are making capital goods and machinery. And that private capital, once it's added, expands the capacity to produce tomorrow, right? Turns out there's no government in that because nothing is being taxed and nothing's being spent. So now if you think of a government what you'd have to do is think of um, a third channel, uh, sorry, a second channel, where everything that's not consumed, everything that gets divided between, gets divided between um, what becomes private saving and what becomes tax collected by the government, right? So anything that you don't consume today, right? Whatever you consume, cons what you were consuming uh, from your income that goes into the consumption basket, but anything that you're not consuming is either private savings or taxes, right? So taxes, we have to, first thing we do is pay taxes. Then we see how much disposable income we have. And from the, then we decide how much we're gonna consume and how much we are going to uh, um, save. So saving and consumption is one aspect, but the other aspect is output that has not been consumed today becomes taxes. And that get taxes gets collected. And then that tax gets collected by the government and that is turned into public capital. And the public capital is often crucial for 
private capital. So there is a link. And this is the link we've been talking about. So without the mobile phones, regulatory framework for mobile phones, there were not enough fishermen who were fishing. Without roads, there are not enough shops and enough entrepreneurs. Who, this thing. Without a property rights, there are not enough. So there is a relationship between public capital and the public capital here can be tangible or intangible. So the public capital itself here um, can be tangible or intangible. So tangible are roads, uh, roads, you know, kind of uh, roads, uh, railroads, canals, and all kinds of other things. Intangible are anything which is legal, frame, anything which is a legal framework. So the problem with government's capital, public capital is that while private capital is easy to see and it's all tangible, usually, public capital can be tangible or intangible. And it's because, and why is, you know, so the question to ask yourself is why do we need public capital? And the reason we need public capital is because some things which are crucial for economic activity are either non-rival or non-excludable. Okay. Now, I'm gonna leave it here. The paper is there, you know, the paper is there and works out and it works out a new version of the solo model once you add public capital. And it kind of shows you how you can get trapped as a poor country in a developing trap. Uh, and you know, I don't, I, 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 if you, it's, it's again, something that you can read, but it's crucial. Um, the thing I want to point out is now from a poverty trap or poverty kind of poverty as experienced from individuals. Right? So we've been talking about poverty trap or poverty as experienced at the level of the country. Let's talk about individuals now. So what are the channels that trap you into poverty? Okay. So one of the channels that traps you into poverty is undernourishment. And we saw how markets are crucial for undernourishment, right? So if you don't have access to market, you're gonna undernourish yourself. So the thing about poverty is that these channels are intricately related. So they're not simple dynamics. There is something underlying this, which is simpler to understand, but they are numerous channels. And once you're strapped into poverty, these channels reinforce. So undernourishment both leads to nutritional, uh, sorry, leads to infectious diseases and infectious diseases lead to undernourishment. So there's a bit of a feedback thing. So if you're undernourished, you don't have enough calories, you don't have enough vitamins, you're more likely to have infectious diseases. And you know, uh, at the back here, I'm thinking about healthcare sector, right? So healthcare sector hospitals are crucial for this. And what are healthcare hospital? They are public goods. In developing countries, they're often public goods. It's impossible to have a private market for that. So then undernourishment can lead to, undernourishment, sorry, can lead to lack of child's development, right? So a child which is undernourished at a particular age never gets, you know, the, the, the body never develops and they are less likely to have work capacity and back in poverty. Undernourishment lowers a uh, individual's capacity to work, again, leads back to poverty. An infectious disease leads to poverty through undernourishment, but can directly also lead to poverty, right? So, you know, infectious disease, right now we are living through an era where an infectious disease is basically making people poor. So if you have COVID and long COVID, these are people who are, wh whose economic prospects have been severely dented. Um, and that's leading to poverty independent of any of these other channels. So the whole linkage between poverty and uh, poverty, re self-enforcing, reinforcing channels um, is a complicated one, but what unifies it is the range of public goods that correct for it. 
So the range of public goods that correct and kind of reset and reduce the pro pro probability of an individual finding themselves in a poverty trap are the following. So the first one is local markets. Local markets are absolutely fundamental. If you don't have local markets, uh, your population is very likely to be in a poverty trap. So I have another paper that I'm working on. Uh, it's a bunch of incomplete papers, but this is another paper that I've been working on, which looks at what happened to local markets, market towns in Sussex in UK, once you introduce railways. And what we find is once you introduce railways, the nature of the local market changes. You have fewer local markets, but they are bigger markets. And that's because you could use railway to get to the markets, right? But if you don't have local markets or the local markets are inaccessible, that is related to poverty. Then education, right? So education plays an important part. And you know, if you don't have a, a populations which have access to schools, schools can be a place of nourishment, school can be a place of social networks, school can be a place of learning. And that's absolutely critical. If you don't have, if you don't have schools, um, available in your in your country, chances are your people, your uh, the population in the country is going to be poor. And I remember in the 80s when I was growing up in India, and I used to hear I, mean, I was about that was a barely a teenager, and I heard that there's a program called Operation Blackboard in India, and the idea of that program was it was a nationwide program was to ensure that every school in India has a blackboard. And as somebody who's growing up in a middle-class family and getting good education, it baffled my mind, even as a 12 or 13 year old, that there were schools that did not have blackboards. They did not have a single blackboard in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the school. You know, what is, what is a school without a blackboard? So when it comes to education and schools, these are public, public goods and if they don't exist, if there's no public capital and schools do not exist, poverty is going to be a problem. And underdurishment falls in the category of both healthcare, hospitals, again, public capital. So public capital is absolutely key. The bit about banking is something that I haven't touched on. And there's a lovely paper, which I'm going to put a reference to. I'm sorry, I forgot, and forgot to put it. But the reference, this lovely paper, which says, that India's growth in the 80s was largely due to a policy of ensuring that rural areas get banks, right? And uh, so they basically show that rural areas that got banks through government dictate in the 70s People started saving more, people could get more credit, economic activity went up, poverty went down on those areas. And in a way, if you think banking is also an automated surface because what banking does, it is moves savings and what are savings? Non-consumed output, right? So the key thing about automated surfaces is it moves output of goods from one place to another quite easily. But banking is able to transfer savings from one part of the country to another. So the moment you have a local bank, you're connected to the, to the rest of the country in a way, uh, in a way because you can get savings from the rest of the country and you know, use that to form cap capital. Or if you have savings as an individual, you can lend it to the best available opportunity in the country, right? And so it's something that I haven't explored and I, I don't think I'll explore. But I just want to put that there, that the banking becomes absolutely clue. And the interesting thing is that if you think of all the public capital that's crucial in terms of solving the problem of undernourishment, education, banking, and local market, infrastructure and automated services play an absolutely cool key role. You know? So example of this is roads. If you don't have roads, you don't have access to local markets. And there is a nuance there because uh, about two years ago, I was in a in in a in a particular area, rural area, um, 
uh, staying with my uh, staying with uh, some people I knew. I was doing some work, and uh, we had access to a car, and you know we used the car, and you know the local market was about ten minutes drive of uh, a five minutes drive away, and we'd go and buy things. And uh, the car on one particular day was busy, and so the the person who was working for us said, you know, you can go to the local market. It's not very far to walk. You can just walk there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll send you my, uh, send my child along with you and he helped you get there. And it was the most terrifying experience because the roads were beautiful, but there was no payment. And the cars in this rural area kept speeding up and down, but there was no payment. So every time a car came speeding, I was more worried about the child than I was about myself, but it was absolutely the most ex terrifying experience. And one of the fascinating things is that, you know, I meet developing economists who say roads are really, really important. And I say to them, payments are more important because you're taking away somebody's ability to access the market if you're making roads, but you're not making payments. You're making a dangerous, violent, you're, you're putting a dangerous, violent environment, what used to be their environment. Right. So the basic idea that I want to talk about is that what we're driving towards is that public capital is important, but underlying public capital, the intervention that is crucial is the range of infrastructure or automated services, which is how do you move from one thing to another. So the notion of space is critical for development and you can shape the space in such a way so that economic activity takes place and you can tax that economic activity to solve the development problems. And the problem of development, or at least in, from this perspective is one where these channels are blocked for some reason or the other, okay? So we'll pick up on this more. Um, I'm already two minutes over the time. I'm sorry about that. Um, if you're gonna leave, that's fine. But if you have a question, I'm happy to answer any questions. Anything? that pops any comment i mean it doesn't have to be a question if anybody has a comment or observation okay um yeah sorry yeah i've just got one thought yeah. when you when we were talking about let me find my note intangible public capital so we we're talking about legal frameworks and regulatory frameworks yeah. Is there is there something that says social norms are also public capital? So the order of society is is of good to society because if we didn't have the social norm of queuing, then no one would ever get anything in the shops or something. Is that absolutely absolutely? Yeah. You know, so um, I'm going to bring this example back again. But uh, there's a lovely experiment in Israel, uh, which pinpoints exactly this point. So. There used to be, I mean, if you've read uh, Free Economics, it's mentioned in Free Economics, the book, but here's the example. So there was a nursery, there was a nursery in Israel. Uh, and, you know, in the nursery, the problem was that the parents would always, some parents would always be late to pick up their children. And when they were late to pick up their children, the teachers would have to stay back. Uh, and that would be obviously, you know, made life difficult, extra work. So a bunch of economists went there and created a particular experiment. And what they did was they started, they said that anybody who comes late would have to pay a nominal fine, a fine which was equivalent of $10. And then what they looked at is what are the proportion of parents who were coming late? Now, you would expect that the proportion of parents who are coming late should fall, right? Yeah. But turns out it went up. And the reason it went up was because now parents felt that they had the right to be late. In the past, if they were late, they were inconveniencing the teacher. So there was a social contact and the teacher was up, you know, you were being unreasonable. Whereas now that you're paying for it, it was like a babysitting service. So then what the, what is, uh, and you know, what is critical was that it was $10. It was not $100. Then they removed the $10 thing and the proportion of people coming late did not go down, right? So over centuries, we have learned how to get along with each other, formed social norms, which are absolutely right. You're right, they're public goods. We have formed the social norms and 
regulatory frameworks can help it, but they also displace some of the social norms. And the key thing is to understand which regulatory frameworks, which social norms to displace and which not to. So, you know, I always do wonder whether fining people for overstaying in the parking lot or parking correctly, has that increased the problem of parking in UK or has it made it better? Right. I mean, in the, you know, social norms were a very large part of a British society. And in my 20 or 25 years here in UK, I've seen the erosion of that. Now, you know, you can look at it another way where you say a lot of people jumping the traffic lights in, in some country and you think it's important to bring that regulatory framework. So this relationship between the intangible public good uh, and the social norms is something that is difficult to kind of examine, um, and difficult to understand, but it becomes a key to the development process. And, yeah. and is this one of these, uh, sorry, it's over time, but is this sort of no. one of the things that um, if we're to consider failures in development would be a misunderstanding of a social norm? So if, let's say, or, you know, very, I'm, I'm sure the studies, I can't remember, but, you know, a, a very well-meaning policy of going to a developing nation and saying, right, you now need a constitution and a law that says this with a failure to understand, let's say, nomadic um farming and agriculture and then you've disrupted a social norm and then actually it will it, it, it would do worse than doing nothing is that sort of a... yeah so yeah and this is the fascinating bit which is even you know so my uh, my my phd supervisor was my tish katak and one of his papers he writes he says development is a process of changing your social norms and you know for a society the question is do you want to trade off a social norm uh, for prosperity. So sometimes yeah. what you do is, you know, and so, you know, the, the reason it's not easy to answer is because sometimes you displace a social norm and you create, create a vacuum. Because, you know, like Afghanistan is a really good example of this in the last 20 years, which is, or, or not only the 20 years, I mean, since the Soviet invasion, where you've external forces have displaced social norms, but yeah. not been able to create a social norm. But in other places, where you displace a social norm. And you know, growing up in India, I've seen how social norms have got displaced, but in large parts of India, it has led to huge amount of prosperity. And, you know, and so in this, I don't think the answer is a kind of a, a simple answer. You know, and even, even this is the answer we are struggling with in developed world. So it's not about even in a developing country. This is the question that we've been struggling with in terms of how to deal with the pandemic. So social distancing be a social norm or should it be enforced from the state? Yeah. Right? And we don't have the right answer, right? So we don't have the right answer because in certain communities, social distancing has emerged as a social norm, but other communities, anti-social distancing or anti-mask has emerged as a social norm. And it's not even clear whether the government stepping in, right? So in a Texas, uh, Texas has removed this mask mandate. And yeah. you know, I don't know if this is captures a representative restauranter, but I was hearing restauranters saying, I don't want to be the mask police. Yeah. Right. I don't want to be mask police. And so, you know, to answer your question, it's impossible to say anything. Uh, in development, all we know of is examples of this, but there is no unified theory or you know unified. The best person to read on this is uh, Elena Ostrom. Uh, Elena Ostrom, and she won a Nobel Prize uh, for um, her work with uh, Williamson, the transaction cost that we were talking about today. Uh, that's the work of Williamson. Um, and she, Williamson for transaction cost and Elena Ostrom for public goods, uh, sorry, common, common pool resources. And what she did was she looked at across the world. So like, for example, she has papers in Nepal where she looks at how do people look after their ponds, local ponds. And they found that there was a clear set of social norms where they look after their ponds and their people are punished. Now it's been taken away by people who are pro-market to say, we don't need the government. And there is a very, that's a very kind of, you know, she has been co-opted by 
you know, they, she's been co-opted by people. I and mean, I'm, I'm sure she's turning in a grave to imagine that she's been co-opted by free uh, uh, market fundamentalists. But the key to reading Ellen Ostrom is to also realize that the social norm emerges, social norms emerge in populations which are extremely stable. Yeah. The moment you have dynamic population, the moment you have dynamic population, the social norms become very difficult to enforce. And this is the problem that you're dealing with when it comes to social norm of social distancing. So it turns out, I think it's much easier to establish the social norm of um, social distancing within schools. And the government could have used schools to spread that social norm within the society, but there wasn't a proactive effort. And I'm saying this with all hands up, saying it's easy to criticize from the outside and it's very difficult to be inside the government and actually get things done. But my perspective would be that using school teachers would have been the best way to propagate information about the coronavirus. Using the sign teachers in schools to educate the community would have been the best way. And also these control spaces in schools would have established a norm among students. Uh, and I'm, I'm not talking in abstract because this has been done in India, not in the context of coronavirus, but in the context of disaster. So in disaster management, they, there's a concentrated effort, con there's an effort it was included in the school's curriculum and children are taught simple principles of what to do under disaster. And the idea is to educate the population through schools and spread that idea in the society. Right. And, you know, how successful it is or not, we don't know because this has only happened five or seven years ago. Uh, but it's not an easy answer. But what we are struggling with today is to understand what is the role of the government, both in the developing and developed world. Yeah. Right, I mean, you know, we've gone past the kind of Washington consensus perspective of saying, you know, governments, we don't need governments. We are all struggling to understand. And that's where the, that's where the literature is. And, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, and so uh, bringing the government back into what was largely models that were developed in the eighties and nineties, which don't have government in it um, is, is kind of there is a very small movement in the movement in the literature, but that's where we are. Okay, I hope that uh, is a useful okay. answer. Okay, Thanks. anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, by the end of you know by uh, either by the next session or um, you know in in the next one week, I'll put up the assignment. So I'll put up the assignment question uh, in the next one week. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.